Hold the face mask. Holding. Turn me around. Okay, I know. All right, go. Make him up in the way. Make him up in the way.
on. All right, John, go back to your seats. We're going to continue to see. You know, it really should be. I don't know. I mean, to you, see the, the general area of your seat. Stay on your feet. Sorry. Um, you know, we think that we believe that uh, in worshiping the Lord, we should really, from our whole heart, our whole being. I mean, when you go back and look at, at David, he was embarrassing his whole family when he was dancing. He said, "Will you stop doing that?" He said, "I'll become even more dignified than this." And, uh, of course, we're not going to talk about what he was doing, but we just have to go to the Bible and read that one. So, uh, but just he was not. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, fully clothed. Dancing before the Lord. But we're not doing that at Camp Father Russell because that is against the rules of Israel. So, uh, anyway, so um, we're going to move towards more of a worship time and kind of just kind of lift blood pressure for us as 50 year olds down that down. So uh, if you will, pray with me as we continue worship, Lord. Father, thank you so much that your Holy Spirit gives us such an infectious joy that uh, the, your scriptures literally call it hilarious, that, that we are able to express that uh, really inexpressible joy that you place inside of us. And I pray that, that we would be filled with that this week, that these campers would sense the joy of the Lord in, in the staff and in our messages and in our singing and in our time together that they would just connect uh, to you, Father, and that we would worship you in a, in a very real and connected way. And we pray in Christ's name.
say that again. All right, let's play a game. All right. All right. We're going to play a game. It's called Trump or Monkey. Y'all ready? Anybody played this game before? No. no. Lewis saw me play it earlier. Okay. So all you got to do is tell me if the picture is Trump, Donald Trump, or a monkey. All right? Here we go. So we're going to start the quiz. Here we go. Trump or monkey? Can you tell right there? You think that little clip? That's a monkey? All right. Give me, all right, everybody who votes Trump, raise your hand. Everybody who votes monkey, raise your hand. Okay, we got monkey, so we're going to guess monkey. It is Donald Trump. Sorry. So, pathetic. That's what Donald Trump would say. Okay, so, we're 0 for 1. Here we go. Next one. Next one. Here we go. Is that Trump or a monkey? All right, give me, uh, let's go Trump. Raise your hand. Trump, raise your hand. All right, monkey, raise your hand. Oh, wow, it's monkey again. All right, so monkey. And wrong. That's Donald Trump. So, Sorry. Low energy. You're low energy. 
Okay, so next question. Is that Trump or a monkey? That is a monkey. All right. So uh, raise your hand if you think it's Trump. That's a Trump. Oh, boy. All right, raise your hand if you think it's a monkey. So we're still monkeys. One, three for three. All right. That is a monkey. There we go. You're right. So, fun game, isn't it? So we got it. One of three. Here we go. Is that Trump or a monkey? All right, raise your hand if you think it's Trump. Hey, buddy, I think Trump ain't with us. All right, raise your hand if you think it's a monkey. Claire, what do you think? No, no, I mean, what do you think this vote is? Go, go Trump again. Trump, raise your hand high. High. And now monkey. That's monkey. That's monkey. Okay, that is Donald Trump. You're wrong again. So we are one out of four on this. Y'all are horrible. Okay. It's fake news. That is fake news. Is that a pretty good Trump? Oh, is that a good Trump? All right, Trump or monkey? Here we go. All right, right, all right, so take a look. Good luck. All right, so raise your hand if you think it's Trump. I think that's Trump. All right, raise your hand if you think it's a monkey. I think Trump won that one. Okay, let's see. Oh, it's a monkey. You're wrong again. You are terrible at this game. All right, here we go. We're going to do one more. Trump or monkey? That's definitely Trump, right? All right, raise your hand if you think that's Trump. Raise your hand if you think it's right. Raise your hand if you think it's a monkey. I think that was Trump. So that is Donald Trump. Yeah. There we go. Yay. That's huge. That's huge. Okay. So we'll come back. Maybe we'll come do that again sometime. All right. That's a fun little game, isn't it? All right, Lewis. Lewis, you can. Thank you, brother. It, it needs to reconnect to the machine. I put it on the Wi-Fi. So. All right. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. Y'all were horrible at that game. So, um, all right, what's next? What's next? Let me make sure I get all my ducks in there. Well, it's good to be here with you guys. Um, I, I know a few of you here. I know a lot of counselors. So, uh, we're excited. Wow, it feels like it's early. I have that much time. I'm not going to preach near 40 minutes. That's what I've got, right? So uh, there's there's stuff. Right? Eight thirty. Okay. Right. Y'all buckle up. Here we go. Uh, so uh, you want to chime in before we get started with anything? Uh, something about us. I am nine years older than my wife. So I met her when she was in high school. No, that's not true. That's not true. That is not true. That's totally unbelievable. She was a sophomore in college. So. <laughs> All right, cool, Liz. Mom's mic, mom's mic. There, we go. there it is. You could have taught me in what grade? Uh, ninth, 10th, or 11th. But he didn't. We didn't know each other. No, we did not know each other. So, <clears throat> we've been married for 18, 19, almost 19, 19 years. years we got five children, which, which is laughable at this camp. So <laughs> they look at us and snicker. Yeah, whatever. In other places, it's like a lot of kids. Five's a lot. So when did you start leading worship? I started when I was a sophomore in college. A guy, a guy picked up a guitar off the side of the road and grabbed it and said, here, you're going to learn how to play guitar. He was the, my disciple. He said, you're going to learn how to play guitar. And the action was so high, it nearly cut my fingers. Um, but I started learning then and led a little bit in college. And then we met on worship team in Opelika, Alabama, when I was a teacher and coach and she was in college. And that's how we met. And then uh, two years later, we uh, decided that God had called us to marriage. And so we got married in 2005. And uh, our oldest child is in uh, Europe right now on a trip with school. Um, and so she is flying out of Barcelona, Spain on Tuesday. And Claire won't be here Tuesday night because she's going to go pick her up. And then we've got Isaac Jones, uh, Lewis and Eli who are here with us so those four and Sydney will be here on Wednesday so we're excited to have her and so um, that's a little bit how about how many us. of you are in seventh grade going into seventh grade okay so that year for me in youth group there was no one to lead worship not a guitar player no kid no adult and so I started leading a cappella. and by the time I graduated we had a full band including a violinist so it was really neat to see us go from nothing at all um yeah, so we met in a worship team, and I was leading that team, and Claire was a vocalist on that team, and uh, we connected, became very good friends. 
uh, really spent a lot of time hanging out in a very, very friendly way. And then a year and a half into it, we're like, okay, well, what about this? And so <clears throat> prayed about it and felt the Lord lead us to marriage and got married. And here we are, 19 years later, Ponderosa Bible Camp. Who'd have known? So uh, anyway, all right, let's talk through what we're going to talk about tonight. So this week, we're going to talk about colossal failures of the faith. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, so every time I say that, you got to say bum, bum, bum. Okay, so colossal failures of the faith. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, there we go. So that's what we're going to discuss this week is colossal failures of the faith. Bum, bum, bum. See, you got on top of it. Good job. See, all y'all are just slacking. The colossal failures of the faith. Bum, 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 bum. There we go. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. And so um, if you have your Bibles, you want to open up to Hebrews 11. I'm going to read a very lengthy passage of Scripture tonight only, and then we're not going to read it again. But I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Hebrews 11. And we're going to walk through some stuff, and I'm hoping that at the end of the week that it will you'll find some hope in, my hope is that you find hope in, in what we discuss. So, Hebrews 11, I'm not going to read every verse up here. But I am going to read uh, several of them. So I'm going to skip a few of them just to kind of keep the length down a little bit. So you'll see on the screen up here that it won't go, it won't be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 all the way down. I'll, it'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, and then maybe jump to 7 or something like that. So just keep up. You can look on the screen and it'll probably give you a better idea. But you can reference Hebrews 11 maybe in your God Night Times and some of the things that we talk about this week. So uh, theologians call this chapter of the Bible the uh, the Bible's Hall of Faith. Not Hall of Fame like Baseball Hall of Fame or Football Hall of Fame, but Hall of Faith. Uh, F-A-I-T-H. Not that faith either. It's the faith of the Bible, which we're going to talk about. <laughs> Sorry. That's random ADHD. It kicks in every now and then, and there we go. So, Hall of Faith is kind of a celebration in Hebrews 11 of historic figures in the Bible and their, uh, and their faith in God in Him working through them. So I want to walk through some of this, and we're going to start in verse 1, and let's just start reading along and see where we end up. Okay, so now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. There's the definition that the Bible gives of faith. For by it the people of old received their commendation. I'm reading, by the way, from the English Standard Version. If you're interested. So that's what this is. A little bit wordy, but I like the translation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what was what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. God made it out of nothing. By faith, verse 4, by, by faith, Abel. So here it starts the commendations. Here it starts describing these heroes of the faith of the Bible and what they did. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Does anybody remember the story of Cain and Abel? Everybody know what that is? Who are Cain and Abel? Adam and Eve's Brothers kids. of who? Adam, born of who? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve's first kids, right? Cain and Abel. Alright? So a uh, sacrifice that Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. Remember, um, Abel gave the more acceptable sacrifice. Cain got mad. And what did he do? Killed him. He didn't like it, so he killed Cain. I mean, Abel. Cain killed Abel. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Remember, Enoch was one of the Old Testament prophets that never died. God just came in and took him away. He said he walked and then he was no more. And so he just went on. The Lord just took him on to, uh, to glory so that he should not see death. And when he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended and having pleased God. All right, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah. Everybody knows the story of Noah. Being, earned, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Let's skip to verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive 
as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going, by faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Remember, God had promised Abraham, I'm going to make your lineage, your your um, children will be as the numbers of saints. You know, uh, Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. And I'm one of them, and, and so are you. So, by golly, let's just praise the Lord. Huh? Right arm? Right? Okay, there we go. There we go. Now you're with me. Okay. So, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, his wife Sarah herself received the power to conceive, even when she was uh, past the age, uh, since she was considered him faithful who had promised. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his son, each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship at the head of his staff. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the, to, uh, the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And then it goes on. So that's kind of, it hits those as big, big markers, and then it hits these as kind of just a broad sweep towards the end of the chapter. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. So there is Hebrews 11. And so um, having said all of that and read through that, and I don't know if you've ever read this before, but I remember distinctly one time uh, walking through Hebrews 11, and I had been doing some study in the Old Testament. And I was hitting some of these highlights of Hebrews 11. And I remember thinking, you know, I don't, I don't remember these stories like this. There's, there's parts of this that it, it was just kind of weird. I was like, there's, there's other parts of these stories than just this right here. And, and it made me wonder, like, what is, this, what is God doing in Hebrews because the stories didn't quite match up with what I remember reading in those Old Testament stories. And let me give you a couple of examples. So I want to walk through this so that you can see where we're going to go. I want to go back to this Abraham thing for just a second. All right? I got to make it bigger over here on my screen so I can see that. My eyes do not work so well. <laughs> I had to zoom out a little bit. I'm like, can't read that. Okay, so Hebrews 11, 8. So let's look at this stuff. I'm going to share three of these examples, and then I want to talk you through why we're calling this Colossal Failures of the Faith. Oh, that's not good enough. That's terrible. Colossal Failures of the Faith. There we go. All right, so let's look at this scripture. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out uh, to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, who does, whose designer and builder is God. Doesn't that sound like, man, I want to be like Abraham, right? Wow, he's so faithful to God. And he was always faithful to God. And then I was like, but he, how do you mesh that with Genesis 12? So look at this story. So this comes straight from the story of Abraham. Now there was a famine in the land. Abraham was taking his wife and they were going to Egypt. And there was a famine in the land of Egypt. So this time he's not called Abraham. He's called Abram before God changed his name. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was severe in the land. Watch what he does. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me 
but they will let you live. So you say that you're my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. Anybody else think that's a weird story? Okay. Anybody else read that and go, huh? Wait. So God promised that you were going to have a son. And God was very distinct in his promise that it was not going to be anybody but you and Sarah's son. They're going out. They get to a place. Abraham, or at this point, Abram, gets scared and says, hey, listen, you're a good looking. Boy, you are a hot mama. Sorry. That was just the <laughs> You're really good looking. Listen, when we go in there, they're not going to like it that I'm your husband. They're going to kill me just to get to you. So you tell them that you're my sister. Because that's really not a lie. You're kind of a half-sister anyway. Which he was, by the way. He was kind of a half-sister. And then they won't kill me. So let me ask you this. When you go and read Hebrews 11, and then you read that story, do you see, like I would see going, that doesn't really add up. Because Hebrews 11 makes it sound like, man, it was dead on, spot on all the time. But he wasn't. And so I had trouble. So that's why I kind of called that a colossal failure of the faith. <laughs> so, so that's one of them. So that's a, and by the way, there's other stories about Abraham that you go read through and you're going, wow, that's weird. Um, and so here's one. Let's, let's throw Sarah in because we're not going to just take the husband and throw him under the bus. Let's throw the wife under the bus too. So Sarah, here because it talked about Sarah in Hebrews 11. So it says this, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. So what I'm seeing is Sarah going, Lord, you are so faithful that I'm going to rely on you. Won't you say it? You say it. Lord, you are so faithful. Lord, you are, Lord, you are so, so faithful. faithful. And I just know that you're going to fulfill your promise. And I just know that you're going to fulfill your promise. And I have no doubt in my mind then you're going to fulfill your promise. And I have no doubt in my mind that you're going to fulfill your promise. Okay, so that's what I see in Hebrews 11. It's like, she is like really on it. Right? And so it says that uh, she considered him who's faithful who had promised. Okay, so now, but then you're going to be able to read this one maybe. <laughs> so here's the story of Sarah. So God visits Abraham to tell him one more time because he, he had this promise for 25 years before he ever had uh, Isaac. So he's waiting and waiting and waiting, and he's doubting, and he's going into lands and going, tell him you're my sister. He actually told him, told Sarah to tell him that there were sisters twice. He didn't just do it once, he did it twice. All right, so here's what he is. So these guys visit to tell Abraham again about the promise. Your wife is going to conceive a child that is your child. Not, by the way, there's another story you've heard where Sarah says, I can't have a child by you. Take my maidservant. And have a child with her, right? Hagar. So you know Hagar and Ishmael? So that's how they tried. So it's like, how is Hebrews 11 matching up with this? Anyway, so this is a story where God visits Abraham and, there, and, it's, and visits in the form of three people. And they're outside the tent. Here's what happens. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you in about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, well, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him, and she thanked God and praised God, saying, Oh, blessed Lord, thank you for giving me a child. Is that what this says? No. no. What does it say she did? She laughed at what God said. And then God said, Is your wife in there laughing at me? And Sarah goes, Uh, and said, the Bible says she denied it. Uh uh, I didn't laugh. And God says, come on, I'm God. I know you laughed. Like, how do you tell God? I didn't laugh. It wasn't me. Um, anyway, so she hears God say, you're going to have a child by your wife, Sarah, even in your old age. Sarah laughs. God says, why are you laughing? He says, I'm not laughing. But when you read Hebrews 11, you don't sense that same awkwardness that's going on when you go back and read the actual stories. Are you following me? Yeah. So these faithful heroes of the faith have colossal failures. Bum, bum, bum. That's right. Here we go. So, oh, here's another one. So just for, just for good measure, 
the child. This is Isaac. This is they actually had the child. So God fulfills his promise through Sarah. They have a child of their own, Isaac. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing. So now Ishmael's laughing the same way that Sarah was laughing when God said, you're going to have a child. So what does she do? Does she say, oh, honey, it's okay. Come on in here and have a feast with your brother. Is that what she says? Nope. What does she tell Abraham? Which, by the way, it's good to know that in the Old Testament, never mind, I'm not going to talk. <laughs> Wives just have something about them. When they get something on their mind, buddy, it's happening. Ain't that right, Anne? Yep. Right, Sarah? Nobody? Sarah, no, no, no coincidence there, Sarah. So she says, cast out this slave woman with her son for the son of this. So they have a celebration for Isaac. She sees them laughing over there. And she goes, hey, get them out of here. Send them out into the desert. Like, she's like, done. Like, done, done. Gone. Send them away. So that's the faithful Sarah. Right? Colossal failure of the faith. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, that's better. I see my man back there. Okay, let's do Moses real quick, and then uh, then we're going to move into a different direction. All right. So by faith. So here's Moses. By faith. Okay. So here we're in Hebrews 11, so we have to act pious. <clears throat> by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than him to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Like you feel, man, Moses, really? Wow. Man, I wish I could be like Moses. I can't be like Moses because I struggle just to believe God all the time. And these guys were just great at it and all this. Until you go and read Exodus 2. So what had happened? So Moses, by the way, did not, he, he was not like touting the fact that he was, uh, in fact, you know, that he was, an, he was a child of Israel in Pharaoh's palace. He wasn't going around bragging about that. But people knew what was going on. So he ends up killing a guy. He sees an Egyptian who, was, who had the Israelites as slaves, sees him kill him. He goes, or they're in a fight. And he goes and kills the Egyptian. And they go hide the body. Like, I didn't do anything. And so they started getting around that they knew that. And so he sees another argument take place between an Egyptian and a Hebrew. And he says this, and he answered. This is the Hebrew. And he, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me like you killed that other guy? Huh? 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 He saw it. He said, calling him out. He said, so you're going to do the same thing you did to me? Or did to him? Then Moses was what? Afraid. Afraid. And thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses stood up to Pharaoh. Is that what it says? No. Now, what did Moses do? He fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. I don't know why I put that in there, but he sat down by a well. So when you hear these stories, and then you go back, or you read Hebrews 11, and then you go back and read the stories that Hebrews 11 comes from, it just seems like it doesn't quite measure up. But I want to show you two sections of Hebrews 11. I want you to write these down. And one of them is in verse 6, and one of them is in verse 34. So in verse 6, there's this phrase, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we're going to talk about this week, like what does that mean? So when we call Hebrews 11 the hall of faith, and yet when we look at it, we go, well, to me, it kind of looks like the colossal failures of the faith. <laughs> that makes me, what's that movie that that came from? Ice Age. Cruise. What is it, Ice Age? I thought it was Cruise. It's the Cruise. 
It's the sloppy cruise. That's right. That was funny. Oh yeah. I love dun, that. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, without faith, it is impossible to please. It is impossible to please God. And then there's a little little snippet in verse 34. We're made. This is talking about these these people, these faithful heroes. They were made strong out of weakness. This is a phrase Paul uses when he talks about the thorn in the flesh. Made strong out of weakness. When you go and read, and I, this is one of the things that I love about the Bible, is it shows the flaws of the faithful people of God. I need to see that. You know why? Because I got flaws. So when I read, I, I, I know what's happening here is the writer of Hebrews is not ignoring the fact. I mean, certainly the, the writer of Hebrews knew the stories of Abraham and Moses and Sarah and all these other characters. David knows that history. But that's not the point. The point is not what are you doing or what were they doing or what am I doing? The point is what is God doing? And so faith is only as strong as the object of the faith. Okay? Let me give you an example. My wife was sweet enough to get me a, a new truck for my birthday. So sweet, honey. Got me a new truck for my birthday. It was the nice, it's the nicest vehicle that I have owned when I got it. Like, like I've gotten some nice vehicles, but by the time they got to me, they weren't real nice. Like they were really nice at one point, but that was like 10 years ago. But this one I actually got when it was nice. And so I have a key to that truck, Ford F-150. And when I go out in the mornings to get into my truck, I have a high degree of confidence that when I turn the ignition, that truck is going to crank. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't doubt it. Like when I go in the truck, it never occurs to me, is this thing gonna crank? Now, when I was a senior in high school at Fort Payne, I got a car. It was a 1983 blue Nissan Stanza. And that car was, it was good at the time. <clears throat> well, when it got to be in about my senior year or even my grad school year at, at Auburn, in grad school, that. So that was that car had it was about 13 years old and it was pretty ratty and it was starting to really drag like really drag and at one point my dad said listen I got a guy up here in Fort Payne who will buy that thing for scrap for $300 can you get it here I'm like maybe all right I'm gonna work on it I'll try Friday and so it, I, it was a manual does anybody know how to or have anybody seen manual transmission you know the clutch and all that stuff well the cable that went into the floorboard the little housing of it, the sleeve had broke. And so the cable would shift with the thing that's supposed to hold the cable steady. And so you couldn't shift gears. Well, you could, but you ever grinded the gears in a manual? Like that, you know? You ever, anybody ever done that? I know, I have, okay. Well, it grinded all the time because it would never, it never disengaged the, the clutch. And it got so bad that I really couldn't shift it at all. So I drove from Auburn to Fort Payne in third gear whole way. I don't know if you've ever driven down to Auburn, but you kind of need to shift gears. And so I drove, so I just kind of slid through stop signs and watched both ways for traffic and timed up red lights so that I didn't have to get, but I, you know, you can go 10 miles an hour in third gear. You can also go 65 miles an hour in third gear. So that was nice. You can run a whole gamut of, of anyway, when I, it got to the end of that car's life and I took the key out to go real sure what was going to happen. I mean, I could have smoke coming out the engine. It may not crank. Alternator may be dead. Battery may be dead. I, there was zero reliability. So I had a key to both vehicles. That truck that I'm now driving and that Nissan Standard that, that I did drive. Okay? My faith in that key to crank that vehicle 
is only as reliable as the vehicle. It didn't matter how much belief I had that it was going to crank. It was whether or not the vehicle was trustworthy enough to crank. Does that make sense? The vehicle is the part of the equation that's the most important, not me and the key. And so what I want you guys to see is in Hebrews 11, they're not glossing over the flaws of these faithful heroes of the faith. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. And you can do it every time you want to. If you ever think of it, say it. Let's just do it for Colossal failures of the faith. There we go. Okay. So uh, that was not the point, but I wanted to hear it anyway. Okay. When, when you're reading these stories and you read the flaws, and that's what we're going to look at, is the incredible flaws. Of, I mean, these people, and listen, so when you're with your friends and you're in school and you're watching people who, well, she told a lie and she was gospel. Like that is junior varsity sins compared to these people. Like you ain't even, you're not even out of peewee football with the sins that these guys commit. Like it is major, huge, gigantic. Like there's stuff in the Bible that you go read in the Old Testament that I'm not sure middle schoolers should read. Because it's like rough stuff. And these are the people, like Jesus is called the Lion of what? The Lion of Judah, right? That's your name. Lion of Judah, okay? All right? Watch this. Don't go read about Judah and Tamar. That's a rough ride right there. That is a rough ride. Now, everybody's going to have their quiet time on Judah and Tamar tomorrow. But I'm telling you, the, 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 the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and you go read about Judah, you go, how? He could not... He, they wouldn't let him step foot on this property. Like Jesus' namesake could not be here at Ponderosa. And Judah couldn't be here. David couldn't be here. Paul couldn't be here. Certainly couldn't be on staff. Like the background check alone, you couldn't be. They, could, they wouldn't let them clean dishes at Ponderosa because of the background checks. And so the faithfulness is of God. In his work, if God can use these knuckleheads, he certainly can use this knucklehead. And he can use all y'all knuckleheads. And don't tell me that y'all ain't knuckleheads. I'm the knucklest head. You're the knucklest head. There he is. <laughs> so I want you to leave knowing that the object of your faith is the most important, and that is God. And that is what he can do in the life of very, very flawed people. I'm going to finish with the story. So how many of you have heard the name Martin Luther? Have you heard that? Not Martin Luther King Jr., not the, the, the civil rights activist, but Martin Luther. Okay. So he was a the famous theologian that uh, had 95 theses and started the Reformation. So he was, he was saved. Uh, let me just read this story to you. Martin Luther had a catastrophic conversion experience while journeying on a road. In his youth, Luther, caught in a storm, was struck by lightning. How many of you knew that? That Martin Luther had been struck by lightning. Okay. This experience filled the young man with dread of the majesty of God. He knew that he had to get right with his divine judge. Luther did this by vowing poverty, chastity, and obedience. He dedicated himself to a lifestyle of learning about God and subduing his flesh, praying and fasting. His consecration and effort was to no avail, however. The harder Luther strove to please God, the more distant God seemed. The harder Luther struggled, the greater his sense of sin became. To make matters worse, God could read Luther's heart and know that he was motivated by fear and not love. How could Luther escape? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes for a second as we wrap this thing up. And I want you to think about this. Am, am I living as a Christian in fear? Is my life marked by fear? Am I trying to do the right thing? Am I working hard but feeling like I'm not getting anywhere? Like you may be reading your Bible all the time, 
praying the best that you know all the time. And you just feel like, Man, I'm just not, I'm not getting anywhere with this. Maybe it's because you know that there's a sin in your life that you're kind of hanging on to, and so that keeps snagging you all the time. Are you just feeling inside there's a sense of lostness, even though I'm trying to be obedient, I'm trying to follow the scriptures, I'm trying to do these things. I just can't seem to make up any ground. What I want you to experience this week, and, and Martin Luther, we're going we're to talk a little bit more about this story, because he was striving, he was trying. He was longing to be right with God, but just feeling so distant from him. And there's a Bible verse, and we're going to share it. I'm not going to share it tonight, but I'm going to go through the rest of the story later. It set Martin Luther free. That allowed him to experience God's love and forgiveness. So just to begin tonight, let's start to peel back the layers of what we're going to discuss this week. But the main theme is this. Your work, your energy, your effort, all of those things. If it is you, you, and you, it's going to fail. You don't have the sustainable energy. It's your faith in the one who can do this. He's the one who has all the power, all the energy. And so this week is going to be about putting your faith, and what that means, putting your faith in a faithful God. And letting him do the work inside of your heart. Let him transform you. Let him make you new. Let him be who he wants to be in you. And we get out of the way. It's the faithfulness of God. That's what Luther discovered. That's what I hope that we discover this week. <clears throat> I hope that you'll pray through that. Lord, would you grant us the ability to see through the eyes of faith. That... You're the one doing the good work. That you're the one who wants and desires and has made a way for us to experience all the fullness of Christ when we realize we can't. Because you're the only one who gives that. And then when we come to you humbly, we say, Lord, we trust you. Will you make me new? When we surrender to that, then the doors open, the floodgates of grace open, and we find it. It's the object of our faith that gives us that peace with you. Thank you that you're big enough and that you're strong enough. And I pray you break through the hearts of those here this week, that we would see you for who you really are, and we trust you. In Christ's name. Claire's going to share a song. Please, to Brian talk um, thought it might be neat maybe if we kind of think about for ourselves what the things were for us that were our flaws or our greatest um, weakness at your age
share in your goodness together. Let's sing this one more time. <laughs> 